talked about this. Um, you, you might be wondering, like, oh, well, what does, uh, you know, what does APAC do? What does, uh, like, what kind of operations uh, exist in America that create such a stra uh, stranglehold on uh, American politics? Now, uh, this was uh, republished by the Electronic Intifada, okay? But it is originally an Al Jazeera investigation. Al Jazeera was not allowed to publish this investigation, okay? They were not allowed to publish this investigation. Um, originally, they conducted this. Uh, they had a guy go and, and join these lobbying groups undercover and, and document everything. Al Jazeera also reached out to every single person that was in the documentary for comments. And, uh, and then, of course, they were pressured to not publish it. This is the first episode. In the first series of The Lobby, Al Jazeera's investigative unit exposed the role of pro-Israel operatives in Britain. The headline's at 11 o'clock. Israel's ambassador to the UK has apologized after a senior diplomat was caught on camera saying he wanted to take down the Foreign Office Minister, Sir Alan Duncan. Sir Alan Duncan, who's a strong critic of Jewish settlements. An undercover reporter for Al Jazeera doing an investigation into Britain's relationship with Israel. This investigation exposes a covert Israeli campaign to influence British policy. The investigation led to the resignation of Shai Massad. Yes, the UK version was published and it, of course, created a lot of uh, backlash. Uh, which never really went anywhere, but um, but then the American version was slated to be published and they stopped it. A senior political officer at the Israeli embassy. Mr. Massot is also heard describing the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson as an idiot. The I diplomat in question uh, no longer seems to be a functionary of the embassy in London. Uh, and so whatever, whatever he may exactly have been doing here, his cover can uh, be said to have been well and truly blown. At the same time, Al Jazeera had been running a second undercover operation. Some of our reporters' covert filming was included in the first series of The Lobby. His identity became known. Tony had spent five months inside the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. He'd impressed colleagues with his understanding of the Middle East. You have the resourcefulness and the depth you know, to sort of think strategically about this, whereas most people aren't able to do that. A prominent Jewish online magazine described Tony as the perfect gentleman who became one of the town's best-liked Zionist activists. He did amazing work here. The guys don't stop talking about you. They still talk about you. Tony threw elaborate parties. And apparently anyone interested in telling a story about sinister Israeli influence in America's capital couldn't have asked for a better guest list. Uh, I think Kleinfeld is the guy that went undercover, uh, uh, right? In the new edition they of The Lobby, him. we investigate the role of pro-Israel advocacy groups in this country in the first of a four-part series, how the lobby is being drawn into Israel's covert campaign to spy on American citizens. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Can we get some context, please? We're lost. What do you mean, dude? What, like, this is literally the first fucking three minutes of a documentary that very clearly defined exactly what they're doing. It is literally showing you the, the operations that the fucking... What, 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 what context do you need? This is just a fucking documentary with an insider infiltrating one of the fucking Israeli lobbyist groups that show what level of influence and in in, in propaganda operations they, uh, they do, they conduct in the Western world. Fuck! What more context do you fucking need? I don't, I don't get it. Am I crazy? That's literally the context we needed. They didn't say any of that so far, I think. We examine how the lobby led by APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. There you go. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only 
What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. That Mersheimer? But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. Seems to be achieving its goals, threatens future Americans for Israel. We believe in. Let me tell you something, okay? Boycott, boycott, divestment, and sanctions on Israel, okay? That was a, a movement that was crafted after uh, the BDS movement against apartheid South Africa. Israel which also had an apartheid regime, saw its ally, South Africa, uh, not be able to maintain its apartheid status because of the external pressure applied to South Africa. External pressure applied to uh, institutions like banks and, and, uh, and, and commerce that wanted to pull out of apartheid South Africa. That was the major blow that destroyed uh, uh, the, the apartheid in South Africa. So the reason why uh, there is uh, 36 different states where uh, there are anti-BDS legislation written, where like if you want to be a fucking teacher in the state of Texas, for example, you have to sign a, a, a form that says you will never support BDS which is an insane thing, by the way. That is an insane thing that you have to sign. But, of course, and, and, and direct violation of First Amendment uh, rules, by the way, but it doesn't fucking matter. Anyway, if, you, uh, if you're wondering how that came to be, this documentary will show that. APAC wrote that legislation because Israel saw... The, the, the BDS movement work so effectively against the South African apartheid and decided, oh, fuck, we can never have this happen to us. Justice for all people. So that means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. So all the Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. uh, in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory, not for everybody. We are a different government working on foreign soil and we have to be very, very cautious. We have three different sub-campaigns which are very, very sensitive regarding data gathering, information analysis, working on activist organization, money trail. This is something that only a country with its resources can do the best. want to win we have to change our ways we have to think differently and this is waging a holistic campaign why was finkelstein against bds because norm finkelstein believes that uh bds uh is is uh in support of the complete evisceration of the israeli state and that is an untenable solution which i agree with by the way i agree with norm on that um i think that uh there is so there's two different conflicting schools of thought here OK, there are people like myself who believe that the boycott, divestment and sanctions are to end the apartheid state. And some people who believe 
and this is true inside of the inside of the BDS movement as well. That some people believe that uh, this means the the complete evisceration of the Israeli state, like Israel should cease to exist. Now, I don't believe that. Okay, um, I don't. I don't. And and that was a. I, I think Norm's uh, opinion might have changed as well. But overall, overall, uh, the the most popular, uh, the the most popular forces is. Uh, a, a advocate not to completely wipe out the state of Israel or whatever the fuck. It's actually a a movement identical to the South uh, the the apartheid ending the apartheid regime in South Africa. As you've said regarding abolition of the Israeli state in 2023, if you said this in 1950, you'd have a point. But it's 2023. It's unrealistic now. Yeah, exactly. As long as Israel exists, Palestine is not free. This is not true. Okay, I think this is a reductive thing to say. The reality of the matter is very different, okay? It's just not true. I, I, oh, my God. Okay, I have to... Hold on. I'll be back in a second. ...against the other side. Take him out of his comfort zone. Make him be on the defensive. Israel is involved in a secretive influence campaign whose aim is to discredit its challenges in the West. In the Air Force, when you want to win, you have to have aerial superiority. If you want to win a campaign you must have information superiority. And this is exactly the added value Israel capabilities, technological and otherwise, we can bring to the game, and we are working on that very hard. In the United States, the lobby is working with Israel to spy on American citizens. We're giving them uh, data, for example, one day Sima's deputy is sending me a photo, just a photo in WhatsApp, Sit and boycott Israel on a billboard. In a few hours, our systems and analysts could find the exact organization, people, and even their names where they live. We gave it back to the ministry. I have no idea what we did with this. But in fact, three days later, there were no billboards. We use all sorts of technology. We use corporate level enterprise grade. You believe in a one state solution, but you believe that the state should be Israel. I don't give a fuck what you call it. You can call it Israel. You can call it isn't real. You can call it whatever the fuck you want. Okay. What I give a fuck about is equal rights, equal representation and reparations for Palestinians and a right to return for Palestinians. That's what I want. Okay. I don't give a shit what you fucking call it. <sighs> Social media intelligence software. Almost all of this happens on social media. So we have custom algorithms and formulae that acquire the stuff immediately. In terms of like information sharing, we, we did add the Ministry of Strategic Affairs to our operations and, and intelligence brief. Kind of goes back to how do we get information about what's going on in American college campuses. Generally, within about 30 seconds or less of one of these things popping up on campus, whether it's a Facebook event, whether it's the right kind of mention on Twitter, the system picks it up, it goes into a queue and alerts our researchers, and they evaluate it, they tag it, and if it rises to a certain level, we issue early warning alerts to our partners. They operate through subterfuge, and they walk a very thin line between the legal and illegal in what they do in order to gather information and to smear their opponents and just ultimately destroy them. In order to understand how the pro-Israel lobby operates, you have to literally be a fly on the wall. If you can't obtain information publicly, you should try to get into the room through other means. Our undercover report. It's really interesting because, like, I've talked about this before when covering uh, Who is America, right? Sasha Baron Cohen. If you remember back then when that first came out, and I love that uh, show. Um, if you remember... Uh, one thing that I brought up was how easy access was 
when you presented yourself as a, a IDF guy, Iran Murad, like these guys literally are so used to uh, having this level of access. <laughs> Everybody fucking chill out about uh, Sidney Blumenthal's son, who uh, obviously I do not agree with, okay? You know, some people can have uh, good opinions on one issue and then uh, wacky, kooky uh, opinions on every other issue, okay? Uh, there's a lot of people whose brains broke uh, during COVID. Please. Yeah, it broke probably from a large summer sum of cash put in his pocket. Yeah. I'm not here to talk about that. Porter Tony is British and Jewish and had recently graduated from the University of Oxford. He wrote articles and presented himself as a strong supporter of Israel. In Washington, he attended a course on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'm from the UK and I, I'm just taking a course at Georgetown here over the summer. He networked in the social circles of the pro-Israel lobby. Hi, I'm Rona. I'm Tony. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. I'm good. After building his profile, Tony was accepted on a training course in pro-Israel advocacy. Welcome to Feel for Truth DC's second boot camp. Congratulations, everyone, to being accepted. What we're going to do right now is uh, just kind of like introduce ourselves. I'm Daniel. After undergrad, I served in the IDF and the paratroopers for two years and worked at APAC for a year. One session criticized the UN agency that provides aid for Palestinians. Children are taught in UNRWA Palestinian schools to hate Jews. Another lecture dealt with the international... I love that because, like, the, the messaging has not changed. Like, I've heard that so many fucking times from UNRWA. UNRWA, with our dollars, UNRWA is teaching children to hate Jews. It's like, bro, they, first of all, they don't hate Jews. They hate Israel, okay? And that's number one. And you know what's radicalizing them into hating Israel? Not the fucking UNRWA schools, but instead the bombs that killed their fucking mothers and fathers. That might have something to do with that. I don't know. National media. Confronting media bias. During the last war, a lot of times videos are circulating uh, of, you know, of bombed areas or... Big Spotting media bias. MSNBC, Vice News, Jones. Fox, RT... Vox, every every uh, every ounce of uh, Western media is biased against uh, Israel. A lot of it's from Syria. <laughs> nah, you're reading into it. Yeah, it could. I mean, dude, <laughs> black people in uh, apartheid South Africa hated the apartheid uh, regime. It's so, it's so crazy. They must have learned it at school, and not like learned it directly by being subjected to un. Told some, uh, untold amounts of violence and terrorism. State-sponsored versions of untold amounts of violence and terrorism. Yeah. Syria from Iraq 10 years ago, all this stuff. In role play workshops, they were instructed how to respond to criticism of Israel. Can I have a volunteer? The apartheid wall is cutting off Palestine. Boycott Israel. Divest from Israel. Sanction uh, companies that do business with Israel. It's kind of odd to call it a wall, given that like 90 this is a photo. I see a wall. Got it. Why can't Israel do more? It's so funny because they're like they're teaching uh, they're teaching the people to be better debate lords on this, like literally to like disseminate misinformation. Do you see the reintegrated one state solution as a unitary federalist or plurinational form? I am thinking of Bolivia with increased autonomy for indigenous peoples. Uh, I don't know. Um. I, I don't. I don't think that that would work anyway. Uh, I, I, I did. Hold on. Let's just. Our watch undercover this for reporter now. played the role of pro-Israel advocate. Israel is doing a lot to help the Palestinians. I say actually, Israel is doing all the best that they can. But you know, it's a tough situation. The people, businesses in Gaza can't can't freely send their trucks into Israel to sell their goods. I, I think you. Hassan, why do you not cover the woman in Gaza screaming and blaming Hamas? Says stormtroopers 98Z. This is what, look at it, a perfect demonstration. A perfect demonstration of what's going on in the chat, okay?
Get the fuck out of here, you fucking Nazi freak. <laughs> Beyond parody, dude. Yeah. Beyond parody. Just straight up coming in here to be like, hmm, whose side am I on today? Who do I hate more? Uh, Jewish people because I'm an anti-Semitic Nazi or Muslims because I'm an uh, Islamophobic Nazi? I don't know. Play both sides. Hmm. I love I love a guy having like a 1488 uh, Nazi Hitler face as their fucking username coming in here and being like, why don't you talk about the, the gruesome acts of Hamas? <laughs> like... I find that that's actually a misconception. They do allow their trucks and what they don't allow is, is dangerous material. Okay, stop. How is this domestic spying legal? Replace China or Russia doing this and the massive government would be up in arms? First of all, Russia and China do this as well, obviously. Every fucking large power in the world does this. The difference is uh, Israel is allowed to do this because it, Israel's uh, agenda aligns with ours. That's it. Israel as a state is basically another like another facet of uh, the the American military engine, the American espionage machine. There's a lot of information sharing that occurs between Mossad and CIA. Okay. Jeffrey Epstein is a great example of a person who has uh, may, who may or may not have worked with both of these agencies. I don't know. I mean, maybe someone should ask why uh, Piers Morgan's guest that came after me, uh, former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, was spotted at Jeffrey Epstein's, uh, you know, uh, rape palace in New York in 2016. Many, many years after everybody knew that Jeffrey Epstein was a convicted sex trafficker and a pedophile. Why was he secretly going in and out of Jeffrey Epstein's uh, uh, rape dungeon in New York? Hmm. By the way, the Epstein being Mossad was a Joe Rogan thing. Wait, no, it's not a Joe Rogan thing. Joe Rogan, Jeffrey Epstein may have been CIA or Mossad spy. Joe Rogan is a fucking dumbass. Just because he said this as well does not change that reality. Also, uh, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell's father literally was Mossad, Robert Maxwell. And before that uh, was, um, what's the original uh, version of, of uh, the, the intelligence uh, agencies before? OSS. Yeah. You're a dumbass? Wait, what? Like anything Rogan says, something he came. Yeah, like anything Rogan says is something he came up with. Yeah, Joe Rogan pointing to Joe Rogan to say like I don't know about the, the Epstein Mossad connections or Epstein CIA connections is ridiculous because uh, you know he's he's a dumb goof. But yeah, in his defense, Ehud Barak was only at Epstein's mansion more than ten, but less than one hundred times. In his own words, let's be fair to the man. I pre-watched uh, the Road to Apartheid Dog and added timers for TNC to Haas Cord. It's a lot, so I don't know if it's really good, though. Okay. Yeah. After the course, Tony was accepted as a volunteer at a pro-Israel communications group called the Israel Project. It's a Tony Kleinfeld. Uh, Kleinfeld. 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 Like Seinfeld, but with a K. <laughs> The Israel project known as TIP describes itself on its promotional videos as a strategic communications group. At TIP, we believe we've found the answer. Thank you, Chatter, by the way, for the TOS. Israel's enemies have left the battlefield of the Middle East and are now fighting on the battlefield of public opinion. What you have with regard to the United States and Israel is a special relationship that is unprecedented in recorded history. Not simply that the United States gives Israel a tremendous amount of economic aid and diplomatic protection. It gives that aid and protection uh, no matter what, right? It's not conditional. And the Israel Project will go to enormous lengths to achieve that end. During his placement as a volunteer, 
Tony took notes on what he saw and heard in Tip's offices. He worked in what they called the war room, where media and communications are monitored. Staff described having contacts at numerous media organizations. Their primary means of influence is by forging friendships with reporters. Uh, Chatter asked, does that mean any uh, country in the Five Eyes countries could get away with this? Uh, not necessarily. I don't think it's the same. I think the, the level of control that America has over Israel, and uh, I mean, I guess vice versa as well, but the, the collaborative... The... Uh, the the collaborative nature of the uh, Israeli American relationship, like these two, uh, these two countries, is is uh, different than all of the other Five Eyes uh, nations. Like, I, I don't know, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, it's not. I'm deleting twice if you talk still talking about the same shit I heard you like 10 days ago. All right, it was fun. Fuck twice and Amazon. What? What is this person saying? Are you going to cover any other news? I keep checking in and you arguing with chatters. They not going to get it. Guess I need a timeout. K, okay, see you later, king. Yeah, you're right, dude. I I should uh stop informing my audience on on the the many different ways in which uh Oh, sorry. I got I got a, a crazy message. Sorry. Okay. One employee claimed that during talks on the nuclear deal with Iran, Tip applied pressure on the Associated Press news agency to change a headline. Is it because of Israel's strategic location they get all this breathing room? That and also uh I think the the uh collaboration between the Israeli uh security uh, apparatus and the American security apparatus is a little bit more than like the Australian uh, uh, intelligence. Like I'm thinking like strategic location, Australia would be the closest to, and New Zealand obviously would be the closest to what we're talking about. Like Canada is already America's hat. Uh, the UK is already uh, America's little child. Um, the only one that is like, I guess, strategic location, strategically important as far as its location goes is the New Zealand and, and Australia, because of its proximity to China. Um, and even then, I don't think that they could, I don't think they have the same level. Like, like I don't think Japan right now could get away with uh, uh, the stuff that Israel is doing, for example. Does that make sense? Tony read the Israel Project's annual report, which described TIP's mission as building an echo chamber for pro-Israel information. That means using the media to amplify and repeat TIP's messages, as well as what the report describes as neutralizing undesired narratives. Tony saw one document which claimed if we decided to end support for Israel tomorrow, they would cease to exist. They wouldn't cease to exist necessarily, but they would definitely have a much harder time existing. Uh, I wouldn't say they would cease to exist, though. They would just have to cooperate with uh, all the other regional powers rather than, uh, rather than uh, you know, engage in like the endless bombing campaigns and the annexation when they feel like it. You know what I mean? But you're right. It would be very different than the way that, uh, you know, uh, New Zealand and, uh, and, and Australia operate. That the echo chamber was within their grasp. Weeks before he started, Tony discussed with a senior manager how Tip deals with the media. You 
can get a lot more done by making questions get asked by journalists. And if you create it from multiple directions at the same time through multiple journalists, then then you create a kind of sense of crisis. We develop relationships with a lot of alcohol to get them to trust us. The uh, basic message is on the following BDS is essentially kind of a hate group targeting Israel. They're anti-peace. We try not to even use the term just because it, it builds their brand. We just refer to boycotters. The goal is... Which is wild because, like, that's why even in a community such as this one, more people are aware of the top of the hour ad break than they are aware of what BDS is. And every time I bring it up, people go, whoa, BDSM, BDSM. Like, they've very effectively suppressed any kind of communication on even the mere mention of this, like, very important, peaceful movement against apartheid South Africa that was successful against apartheid South Africa. And people don't know the history of it, and they don't even know it e even exists, right? But the top of the hour ad break does exist. And if you don't want the top of the hour ad break to exist, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Here's the three-minute ad break now. It's to actually make things happen now. And to figure out what are the means of communication to do that. In 2005, Palestinian civil rights groups sought a peaceful means to protest against Israel's occupation. They identified goods from Israel and called for their boycott. The BDS movement was born. BDS adopted a nonviolent strategy because we think it is morally consistent and very effective. I think, isn't this guy like on the terror watch list too now or something? Against an enemy that is extremely powerful militarily, we called for boycotting Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it, as was done against apartheid South Africa, to achieve basic Palestinian rights under international law. Over the past decade, BDS has grown around the world. By campaigning for Palestinian civil rights in land controlled by Israel, BDS believes it has exposed a deficiency in the moral defense of the Jewish state. BDS is saying that what Israel has to do is treat the Palestinians in its midst the same way it treats Israeli Jews. The problem is that if Israel does that, there are more Palestinians, or there will be more Palestinians inside greater Israel than there are Jews. And that means that if you had a system where everybody was treated equally and there was one person and one vote that you would no longer have a Jewish state. The secretive Ministry of Strategic Affairs, based in the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem, was given a mission, establish a covert campaign to defeat the BDS movement. <laughs> didn't Dr. Ofer Kassif have criticism on them when he was on the stream? Yes. Um, there is a, a fear that BDS in and of itself could be... Uh, Omar Barghouti literally lives in Israel. Yeah, I, I remember reading something about him recently that like uh, his, his like not allowed to... Uh, he doesn't have freedom of movement any longer or something. Hold on. What was it? What happened to Omar Barghouti? Let's see. <clears throat> Can't find it.
co-founder of Boycott Divestment Sanctions. He received the Gandhi Peace Award in 2017. Um, in March 2017, Barghouti was arrested in Israel on suspicion of tax evasion of about $700,000. But as of June 2021, he has not been charged with any offense in regards to this arrest. Barghouti opposes the two-state solution because he doesn't believe a Palestinian state is viable and would not resolve the fundamental injustices that have been brought upon the Palestinians. He insists he instead supports a one-state solution encompassing all of what is now Israel and Palestinian territories, which these will be replaced by a secular democratic state offering unequivocal equality and citizenship. I mean, basically what I say. Um, and communal rights to both Palestinians, refugees included, and to Israeli Jews. Palestinian refugees would be allowed to return to the state, which would have a transparent and non-discriminatory immigration policy. I think that... This is, um, I think that this is the reason why uh, uh, Norm Finkelstein originally uh, misunderstood and considered this to be like uh, a, a destructive uh, force that is impossible. Yeah, oh, he has travel restrictions. Sorry. Uh, Chatter, who said Omar Borghetti lives uh, in Israel. In 2016, the Israeli Interior Ministry refused to renew his travel permit, limiting his ability to travel abroad, and informed him that due to evidence of his center of life being in West Bank, his permanent residency rights were under review. In March 2016, Israeli Interior Minister Ari Ahderi was quoted as saying, I've received information that his life in Ramallah and that his life is in Ramallah and he's using his residence status to travel all over the world in order to operate against Israel in the most serious manner. Um, br 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 br. I mean, basically, a lot of the counters to BDS is the same great replacement things that you hear, which is that oh, if you want a one, uh, if you want a a uh one state like a one solitary secular state, that means you want Jews to be ethnically cleansed. How are they going to do that by allowing Muslims and Palestinians to come back? Uh, to to this this new formation of the state where everybody has equal rights, and then they will be able to. What are you going to do when Israel removes you off this platform? Go to kick. See, this is what is really frustrating about this conversation. This is infinitely more complicated than the way you present it. Okay, like people aren't stupid. I don't want to speak uh, uh, out of my ass here, but the idea that you think that like uh, you can you know that that like. Israel is going to personally remove me from this fucking platform is, is psychotic, dude. This does not, this does not mean that uh, there are literal doxing operations that uh, in the United States of America that work to sometimes dox uh, random individuals, high school students, college students, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, drivers uh, and the like, like the Canary Mission, uh, you know, the, the Canary Mission project, okay? But as far as like, um, as far as like, uh, you know, forcing someone off of a platform, especially like a prominent voice, uh, that doesn't come without uh, uh, genuine pushback. Eye of Palestine is a great example of this. Um, I have Palestine is a great example of this, obviously. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes of this, okay? No, Israel does not control all types of Western media. You guys are so fucking stupid. Shut the fuck up. My main gripe with BDS uh, against Israel is that it will never work in terms of the boycott. We rely on way too many Israeli goods in our daily lives. Sanctions are the only things that will make any sort of change.